Chapter 6. Van Nomadism Van Nomadism was the first strategy Rail pursued for good reason. Not only is it the easiest lifestyle change or pursuance of freedom, but it just so happens to be the cheapest. As evidence of the latter, ask your average individual in the servile society what their biggest expense is. The answer will almost undoubtedly be housing, regardless of whether they rent or own. So, if an individual has decided that the van life is the lifestyle for them, how do they get started? There are two paths that come to mind now. Just do it and put together a plan. We'll cover the former first. Let's say that John has been working in the Servile Society for 20 years and has $100,000 saved up. He may learn about the lifestyle and pull the trigger immediately, as he has already achieved some level of financial independence. So he buys a vehicle, whether it's a van, camper, RV, car, or whatever, converts it into a liveaboard rig, if necessary, and moves in as soon as possible. More power to John. But this is not the most recommended path. Clearly, van nomadism is a radical lifestyle change compared to stationary dwelling. He will likely have some issues adapting early on, especially in trying to figure out what to do with that extra 40-plus hours a week not spent in the Servile Society's 9-to-5 job. The likely drastic shift towards being extremely self-sufficient will probably be difficult as well. Also consider the fact that his vehicle won't be connected to the grid. He will have to learn to keep up his hygiene without running water. He'll probably have to get electricity to his rig to power his devices, in addition to just adapting to living in a space the size of an average bathroom, among other things. One remedy to these problems is to make a plan and take small steps towards the eventual goal of van nomadism. Take my situation, for example. Being a poor 26-year-old, I don't have a nest egg to sustain myself for a year or two on the road, let alone the capital investment necessary to purchase and convert a van at this time. Even worse, I have debt to take care of before I set sail for sunnier waters. So for me, this will be a one- to two-year journey, which I'm becoming more and more okay with as the more time I take, the more prepared I will be. As Jason Booth, my co-host on the Vanu podcast, always says, proper preparation prevents piss-poor performance. Let's take a look at my situation more specifically to see how such a lifestyle could be decided upon and planned for. I first heard of van nomadism back in mid-2016 when I initially came across Rail's book. It was interesting, sure, but I had no desire whatsoever to pursue the strategy. Reason being, I was extremely passionate about the prospects of finding freedom on the ocean sea. Minimalist sailboating below. But unfortunately, I don't have the investment capital to purchase a sailing vessel. I've never sailed a boat, and I still, to this day, have no idea how to traverse the high seas. So I continued my research into freedom strategies for another two years, still almost entirely unsure as to what my future would hold, until one weekend on YouTube. Towards the beginning of 2018, I stumbled across yet another van conversion video and ended up spending the entirety of the weekend and most of the month watching similar content. I fell in love with the lifestyle concept and made the decision, I'm going to be a Vanu and Van Nomad. It was time to make plans and bring this freer future into reality. I started by brushing the figurative dust off the Excel spreadsheet containing my frugality budget that I had put together a year prior, but failed to stick to for any significant period of time. I updated my income, adjusted my expenses, and recalculated the amount of money I would have left over. Unfortunately, as I mentioned above, the leftover money was not going to savings or my new home on wheels, but was actually going to First Realm banksters in the form of credit card debt, and at the time of publication, still is. However, there was, and is, still plenty to do in the meantime. Namely, make frugality a habit. Get rid of a bunch of stuff I had no need for. Minimalism. Adjust my diet to what I envisioned it being on the road, i.e. little fast food, no microwavable meals, less meat, as it's an expensive source of protein. Conduct market research on vans and take some for test drives to figure out what feels best to me. Ponder or plan the van conversion itself. Research the best, most affordable, easiest to configure off-grid energy setup. Build up my financing portfolio. Generate a handful of passive income streams, this book being one of them, and probably even a few other things, but you get the point. Even if you aren't ready to live your chosen Vanu lifestyle now, there are always things you can do to prepare for it. The above list are all things that I'm currently doing. I'm still paying off the aforementioned debt, although I'm so close. Once that account is closed, the fun truly begins. Let's talk about those next steps and considerations. Purchasing a vehicle for living aboard, the conversion itself, making money on the road, potential legal intercises to exploit, and the modern van nomad community. Chapter 6, Part 2. Choosing a Vehicle for Living Aboard. This is a crucially important step, but that goes without saying. Not only are you purchasing a vehicle, but you're purchasing your mobile home on wheels. The vehicle you choose could very well make or break this lifestyle. It could take you on the most incredible adventures and provide you with a significant increase in freedom, or it could lead you down a road of misery. Recall the saying, proper preparation prevents piss-poor performance. 
What sort of considerations should be taken into account? First and foremost, space. How much room do you need to live relatively comfortable with most, if not all, of your belongings? If you'll be vanuing with others, how much more additional space will be necessary? In other words, would upgrading from a Chevy Astro to a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter van, a super common choice, be enough, or are you now in the realm of campers, RVs, or schoolies? Regardless, you're going to have to get rid of some stuff. Frugality and minimalism are requirements for most van nomads. Secondly, your purpose. What is your purpose for pursuing this lifestyle? Are you going to be a van nomad living in a large city with various squat spots? Are you going to be looking for the most isolated, beautiful wilderness locations? Maybe a blend of both? Regardless, this is extremely important. If you're pursuing the former, you'll constantly get harassed with a massive Class A RV. They'll run you out of town one way or another, whether it's the bludgies or the hostile nature of the servile society to alternative lifestyles. Instead, you should find a vehicle that is suited for stealth camping, whether that's a work van or a box truck. On the other hand, if you're looking for wilderness adventure, your vehicle will need to be outfitted differently, although it would still be wise to configure it in such a way that you can stealth camp if necessary. Thirdly, your budget. Do you have a large amount of investment capital, or are you like me and looking for something on the lower end price-wise? There are benefits and drawbacks to both. Just as with anything in life, if you can afford a new or newer Sprinter van, you might be better off not having to worry about breakdowns or repairs for some time, and you might have a more luxurious home on wheels. But you'll also have to pay for a full coverage automobile insurance on a $30,000 plus vehicle. Repairs will likely be more expensive as well. One vlogging couple I followed spent fifteen grand replacing the engine in their Sprinter. Granted, they were in Mexico. Additionally, newer vans come chock full of electronics, and those can fail. If they do, you'll likely not be able to fix it, and even if you're able to, you probably won't have the tools or instruments necessary to do so. They're typically expensive specialty parts, making you more reliant upon the servile society. If you're traveling through the barren desert far away from civilization and a sensor malfunctions on an otherwise perfectly functioning vehicle, you might be dead on the side of the road until help arrives. The more features, the more that can fail. It's worth noting the computers and possible internet connectivity in newer vehicles. These can certainly be used to track your location, making you more vulnerable to coercion. Not to mention that these computers can be hacked remotely to take over your vehicle. Do you recall the bizarre death or murder of journalist Michael Hastings a few years back? In addition to, I think, the Vault 7 leaks in the late 2017, Granted, I highly doubt that any Vanuan would make themselves such a target where that could actually be possible. If it were, they probably wouldn't be a Vanuan. With older vans, there are less electronics making them easier to repair yourself. Parts are everywhere for these vehicles, too. Sure, breakdowns can still be expensive and painful, but you'll probably be in a better financial position when it's all said and done. The most common vans that fall into this category are Chevy Express work vans, Dodge conversion vans, and Ford E-Series vans. Fourthly, fuel. Diesel engines typically get more miles per gallon when compared to unleaded engines of the same size, but they can be more difficult for the average individual to work on, depending on the vehicle in question. Do some market research of your own and discover what will work best for you in your situation and applicable expertise. Lastly, two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. In my search for vans so far, this has not been a major focus. Reason being, a two-wheel drive van could get me mostly anywhere I want to go. And if I were to ever get stuck on the beach or something, I'd have the tools on hand to get myself out. Oh, the things you learn from van nomads on YouTube. That, and from what I know, 4x4 vehicles are far more expensive. At this juncture, it's not a necessity or a preference for me, but it might be for you. Fantastic. Enjoy those paths further off the beaten trail. It's also worth mentioning two other possible vehicle choices. A standard car or minivan. Believe it or not, there are quite a few van nomads living out of these super small spaces. Some out of necessity, some out of choice. If you don't need much, maybe you just decide to hit the road in your Ford F-150 with a topper, like one of my Patreons does. But maybe you toss a mattress in the back of your Honda Odyssey and see where the road takes you. To close out this section, let's get into a little philosophy. Most everyone has heard of the quote by Benjamin Franklin regarding trading liberty for security. Similarly, there is a trade-off between freedom and comfort. Stationary dwellings are quite comfortable. You have air conditioning in the summer, heat in the winter, hot showers twice a day, a flushing toilet, and all of the electricity you could ever use, and more. But you are inherently not free, as all of the comforts you enjoy are provided by someone else. Rayo and Roberta were a living example of this trade-off. Only their choice was on the other end of the spectrum. Wilderness Vanuing in the Siskiyou was quite miserable at times, and they said as much. But they were free both in the physical sense and also according to their mean time to harassment. 
Clearly, most individuals would not be interested in wilderness Vanu, me included. So the idea is to strike a balance between freedom and comfort, and thanks to technological advancements, it's quite easy to do nowadays. As an example, in my van, I'll have a sink powered by a pump, enough solar power to run all of my devices, internet access via a mobile hotspot, and free Wi-Fi whenever it's available, and some sort of shower system, probably a solar shower. Sure, they may not be as convenient as in my stationary dwelling, but I choose to sacrifice those comforts in pursuance of freedom. All of that said, this freedom versus comfort dichotomy certainly comes into play when choosing your vehicle for living aboard. A two- or four-wheel drive van can go a lot more places than a long, slow, and clumsy Class A RV. Choosing one of these larger vehicles will limit your freedom of access to many of the most beautiful, isolated places. But maybe that's okay for you. A few considerations to leave you with. If you're going to be buying an older van, make sure to check the undercarriage for rust. Look out for water leaks, as they can lead to mold. The holes can be fixed and the mold removed, but it can be a major pain. If you're buying a used vehicle, it might be wise to take it to a trusted mechanic before purchasing. If you're planning on gutting the back of the van for a conversion, don't pay too much attention to stains on the carpet, torn upholstery, stuff like that. These vans, campers, and RVs are everywhere. For the latter two, the best time to buy, I think, is in winter, after people return from their summertime escapist rituals and put themselves away in their boxes for another year. Now, you're ready to purchase your mobile home on wheels. Chapter 6, Part 3, The Conversion. You've purchased your mobile home on wheels. Congratulations. What's next? Well, converting it to a liveaboard rig. This is the part in the process where you will plan, design, and build out your new abode. It's also the part I'm most looking forward to, in all honesty. If you decide to go the RV or camper route, this might not be as relevant to you, but there will likely be some modifications since you will be living aboard full-time, or close to it, rather than just using it for weekend getaways. Therefore, the following information should still be valuable. This is the part where YouTube will be your best friend. Reason being, many van nomads upload videos chronicling every step of the conversion. I'd also point you in the direction of the old Vanu publication Going Mobile. See additional resources below. Most of this zine is dedicated to letters from van nomads back in the 1960s to the 80s discussing their rig, living situations, obstacles, etc. But there are also diagrams, pictures, and tutorials on the conversions themselves. For most, the conversion process consists of eight steps. Gutting the future living space, performing a deep clean of the entire vehicle, patching any holes or leaks, getting rid of any rust, dealing with any mold, etc., running the wires for electricity, installing the roof fans and vents, insulating the van, both the floor and the walls, sometimes the roof, laying down the flooring and putting up the walls, and then the rest of the build-out, i.e. whatever you decide upon. Obviously, this process may vary depending on the individual and the situation, but these are the main steps. Important Notes Make sure to run the wires for your electricity before installing the insulation and the walls. Also, don't half-ass your electrical setup. Do it right the first time. Pay an experienced electrician to help you, if need be. It's cheaper and less painful than your mobile home going up in flames from some silly avoidable mistake. What are some other considerations to take into account? Well, what are your needs? This is the most important question and will determine the complexity or simplicity of the process. If you've never lived out of a vehicle before, you probably won't know the full answer to this question. Therefore, it's recommended that you take practice runs before moving aboard. This way you can determine whether or not this lifestyle is for you in addition to discovering what you truly, really need. Some individuals go with bare-bones conversions. For example, John may decide to toss a mattress in the back of his minivan, grab some gallon jugs of water, some food and a camp stove, and hit the road. Others, like Carl and Jahala, a Vanuan van nomad couple traveling Australia, go all out with their conversion. You can view images of their exquisite rig below, but I would recommend checking out the van tour on their website, www.comfortablylost.com. You can find links to all of their social media accounts there. Readers note, there are photos available which you should be able to find on the website. As you can see, Carl and Jahala spent quite a bit of money on their van and the subsequent conversion, easily more than $50,000 in total. An expensive car, but a cheap home. But you don't have to spend that much. Hell, you can spend as much or as little as you want. I've seen conversions ranging from 500 bucks all the way up to 20 grand. Most van nomads will fall somewhere in the middle but that doesn't mean that you can't have a beautiful, functional, and comfortable mobile home. Here are some features you'll undoubtedly add during your conversion. A bed, a kitchen area, possibly a cooking stove and a sink. Be sure to vent this outside to avoid carbon monoxide poisoning. Storage, lots and lots of easily accessible storage space. A way to dispose of human waste. 
some sort of system to keep up on hygiene, i.e. a shower or wet wipes to hold you over until your next visit to Planet Fitness. Roof vent, an electricity source, gas generator, solar power, wind power, etc. Blackout curtains for privacy if you have windows. Locks inside and out for safety and privacy. Here are some other important considerations to take into account. Make sure everything is secured in the vehicle. The big heavy things most importantly. You don't want your belongings launching across your vehicle in transit. And, God forbid, if you were to get into a high-speed accident, you don't want those things to turn into projectiles. Use lightweight materials when converting your vehicle and keep track of all the weight that you'll be adding to it. Try your best to keep it under the maximum recommended weight. Reason being, overloading your vehicle will impact the handling, braking, gas mileage, etc. Don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good, though. Keep in mind, pursuing Vanu is a lifelong endeavor. As you gain more experience and become more competent, you will always find ways to improve upon your Vanu home base. Hence, why many YouTube van nomads have multiple conversion series on their channel. I could go into a lot more depth, but considering the communication format of this medium, I'll stop here and turn you over to the modern van nomad community on YouTube. They're seriously a helpful bunch. Chapter 6, Part 4, Making Money on the Road. Most individuals pursuing van nomadism will be leaving their full-time job in the Servile Society. Some will have enough savings to live for many years, and others will have to find ways to make money on the road. Looking at damn near 100 different case studies, i.e. van nomads, the average cost per month for this lifestyle is 500 to 1,000 bucks a month, or 6,000 to 12,000 a year, roughly. This includes the following core expenses. Car insurance, food, gas, Planet Fitness membership, AAA membership, cell phone plan for the mobile hotspot, basic health insurance, and vehicle repair and maintenance. There will likely be additional expenses, but those will be determined on an individual basis. For example, I need to factor in diabetes supplies, test strips, insulin, vape juice for my vape pen, and medical cannabis, as I will be first venturing out to Colorado in an attempt to cure or at least treat this dreaded autoimmune disease. Some may fear the unknown. How will I make enough money to survive on the road? Now that you know the average cost of this lifestyle, I hope that fear has been quelled, at least to a certain extent. It's not difficult to make $1,000 a month, the higher end, if you're willing to work. So what are some ways to generate that income? First off, I mentioned above, many Vanuans utilize temporary and seasonal employment. When I venture to Colorado, I plan on taking temporary jobs at ski resorts. Free lift passes, anyone? But it's not limited to that, of course. This is a terrific option for Vanuans. Please, allow me to explain below. Situation. An individual takes a three-month seasonal position at the going rate of $10 an hour. He nets about $400 bucks a week, $1,600 a month, and $4,800 for the entire gig. The theft known as taxation not included. If he or she is living on $750 bucks a month, that comes to $2,250 in living expenses during the time of the temporary position. That leaves the individual in question with $2,550 in savings, or three months of the van nomad lifestyle when it's all said and done. So, hypothetically, a van nomad could take two three-month-long seasonal jobs a year and live comfortably, while having the other half of the year open for adventure. That sounds like a sweet life, right? It puts the two weeks of vacation servile society benefit to shame. But there are other avenues available to van nomads, like creating self-liberational media. Believe it or not, van nomadism is kind of trending. You could leverage that to make some additional income by starting a YouTube channel, a website, blog. You could write a book and sell it, whatever. One cautionary tale, YouTube has been known to shut down and demonetize channels for no reason at all. Get while the getting's good, as the saying goes, but do not rely upon it. The smart Vanuans will never rely upon one single source of income, anyways. Digital nomadism, more generally, is probably the more popular way van nomads make money on the road. This typically consists of freelancing or an entrepreneurial business of some sort. Do you have any marketable skills that you could leverage? Think graphic design, website design, coding and development, online marketing, or a consulting biz. These are in demand, and businesses and corporations often hire freelancers at higher rates, it's a lot cheaper than hiring formal employees. There are three other potential options I learned about from other van nomads. Apparently, individuals have had some success with posting Gigs Wanted ads on Craigslist and Facebook, option one and two. If you're rolling into town and need to make some quick cash, you might try that. I've heard the money isn't always great and it can sometimes turn into tedious odd jobs, but regardless, it's an option if you're in the crunch. The third option is actually quite incredible for van nomads. Delivery or driving services like Uber, Uber Eats, Postmates, etc., if you're ever in a crunch and need to make some money, find a larger city and do some delivering. As long as you have a smartphone, you're almost always in position to make money. And that's huge. Quitting your job in the servile society can surely be daunting. It can put your life in question and cause lots of stress. But it doesn't need to. 
The van nomad life is quite cheap, and there are seemingly endless ways to make money on the road. The only limitations are your creativity and imagination. Chapter 6, Part 5. Jurisdictional Arbitrage, Legal Intercises, and Tricks for Van Nomads. Jurisdictional arbitrage is defined as the practice of taking advantage of discrepancies between competing legal jurisdictions. This is generally practiced between countries and nation-states, but it can be applied here in so-called America as well. Similarly, legal intercises are defined as gray areas within the law that can be used to violate the spirit of the law while simultaneously keeping to the letter of the law. Take my last place of residency, the communist state of Illinois. This hellhole is most well known for being home to the former crime capital of the world. Crippling business regulations, a higher price to pay for anything you want to do, and a mass exodus of citizens into other legal jurisdictions. So what sort of jurisdictional arbitrage methods and intercises are available to me and other van nomads? A legal mailing address, vehicle registration, and residency. The state of South Dakota must seriously be hurting for revenue. In most states, the process for these things is difficult, expensive, time-consuming, and there are always hurdles to jump through. Thankfully, South Dakota wants your money so bad they will jump through the hurdles for you, making it easy to become or remain legally compliant. The first item to discuss is the legal mailing address, as this is a requirement for all of the others. One of the logistical issues with a nomadic lifestyle is mail forwarding. You might not always know where you're going to be, how long you're going to be there, and if what's being delivered can be earmarked for general delivery. Enter yourbestaddress.com. For $189 a year, you can set up custom shipping schedules. For example, if you're going to be in Denver, Colorado for a few weeks, working a short-term gig, you simply put in a request to have your mail forwarded there. There are other features, such as $1 handling fees per shipment, the lowest out there, free junk mail sorting, email notification for outgoing mail, no hidden postage fees, and even a couple other, more minor ones. Better yet, this isn't a mere post office box. This is a legal, physical mailing address, and the first step for the other indices of this website offers. Next is vehicle registration. Here in Illinois, it cost $128 for me to register my 1998 Mercury Grand Marquis yearly. In South Dakota, it's $45. And you can mail in the necessary forms using the address you signed up with before. You don't even have to physically go to the state. Here's the process. Application for motor vehicle and registration. An original title or manufacturer's statement of origin, if new, properly transferred to the applicant. A bill of sale, sales contract or other purchase order. Vehicle weight, empty of course. A copy of your current driver's license and the current odometer reading. Obviously, the bureaucratic bullshit sucks, but it's something you'll have to deal with regardless. That's not all, though. Here in Illinois, the excise tax on new or used vehicles is 6.25%. In South Dakota, it's 4%, with no vehicle inspections or emissions tests. Let's say you decide to buy a brand new Chevy Express work van, which comes out to about $30,000. In Illinois, the excise tax would be $1,875. In South Dakota, it would be $1,200. So, utilizing yourbestaddress.com could net you a savings of $758 on the above example. It may not seem like a whole lot, but why wouldn't you do it if the process was the same or even easier? Next is residency. Now, obviously, as Vanuans, the goal would be to avoid becoming a citizen of any government, but unfortunately, that's not very practical. Therefore, since most everyone will choose residency in some state, why not choose the one with the most legal benefits? Become a South Dakota resident in under 24 hours. Once you've obtained your physical address, you simply complete the required government forms. Gross! Blah! Blah! Yuck. Stay one night in a hotel, RV park, or an Airbnb and trudge on down to the South Dakota Department of Motor Vehicles office. The local bureaucrat will ask you for the receipt from where you stayed. You'll provide one document proving your identity, date of birth, and lawful status, one document verifying your social security number, and you're done. You're now a resident of South Dakota, and it took less than a day. And you aren't even required to live in South Dakota. Hell, you don't even have to visit it again if you don't want to. So what makes South Dakota advantageous in terms of legal intercises? Well, they put together this list. Becoming a resident of South Dakota is simple and painless. You will pay no state income taxes, as there is none. There's no inheritance tax. There's no personal property tax. There's no annual vehicle inspections. We have low-cost registration fees and only a 4% sales tax. Compared to the communist states of Illinois, those benefits could certainly be beneficial. Now that all the governmental nonsense is out of the way, I'd like to conclude this section by discussing three tips and tricks that might help you in pursuit of this lifestyle. First is hygiene. How do van nomads stay clean? Well, some van nomads have showers aboard their rigs. Others are in the wilderness enough that taking a dip in the creek suffices. But almost all van nomads have a membership to Planet Fitness. It really is a no-brainer. 
For 21 bucks a month, you have access to their showers and workout facilities, and Planet Fitnesses are everywhere. The regular hot showers are great, sure, but what if it rains for a few days straight and you're cooped up in your van? Cabin fever is not outside the realm of possibility. Being able to get out of your van to work out would seemingly be a major blessing. But that's not all. With your Planet Fitness membership, you'll have access to unlimited use of hydro massage, unlimited use of massage chairs, free haircuts, free Wi-Fi, among other things. So you could do your morning van life vlog, go work out and shower, upload a video to YouTube, and get a haircut. So I'd recommend you pony up that 21 bucks a month. You'll be glad you did. Next is a AAA membership. If you aren't familiar, this yearly subscription service offers roadside assistance, emergency battery service, fuel delivery, lockout services, tire services, and more. They offer three different tiers. Classic, 58 bucks a year, plus $93 a year, and Premier, $123 a year. As an example, let's take a look at their mid-level tier. For your subscription, you qualify for up to four 100-mile tows, emergency starting, battery service, flat tire service, fuel delivery, vehicle locksmith service, extrication and winching, car travel interruption, an emergency check cashing, and more. Breakdowns happen. They're inevitable. Don't leave yourself stranded, forced to pay for a tow that will inevitably cost more than a yearly AAA membership. Lastly is medical. Clearly, without a full-time 9-to-5 job, it's safe to say that most van nomads go without health insurance. So how do van nomads get dental work done, medical care, or medical supplies? This was one of the major hurdles for me. Without health care, there's no way in hell I could afford my diabetes supplies mostly thanks to the fantastic socialistic healthcare system here in so-called America. So, how did I overcome this obstacle? I posted in a couple of van nomad groups on Fascist Book, and lo and behold, there are other diabetic van nomads. And within minutes, the biggest hurdle was out of the way. And the answer is Algodones, Mexico. Algodones is smack dab on the border of Mexico and Arizona, a short 25-minute drive from Yuma. Algodones has been featured in such publications as Forbes magazine for their high-quality medical tourism industry. Many van nomads have documented their trips there, and it basically looks like an American city, albeit without the ridiculous barriers to entry. English is the primary language, so you won't have problems communicating with your dentist, pharmacist, or doctor. So what about the cost? Believe it or not, you can get the same prescriptions and medical care as you would here in America, but for a far cheaper cost, even without health insurance. Ah, the freer market. As another alternative, you can obtain health care without going through an employer here in the United States. For example, I recently found out that I can get basically the same health insurance I had when gainfully employed for just a little more a month, 245 bucks a month to be exact, versus 150 or so. Clearly, I'd rather not have to pony up that monthly payment, but it beats the hell out of paying full price for diabetes supplies. I'm sure I'll learn a bunch of other tips and tricks once I hit the road, but these are the most common ones. So why should you consider van nomadism for your first Vanu lifestyle change? It's the easiest lifestyle change available. Unlike sailing the open ocean, almost everyone has experience driving a car. Sure, there are some obstacles and hurdles, but they aren't too much to deal with for the dedicated freedom pioneer. It's one of the cheapest lifestyles out there. Recall the average monthly cost for this lifestyle, 500 to 1,000 bucks a month. Most people pay that much or more for their stationary dwelling in the servile society. With that expense out of the way, this enables you to work less and utilize that time doing whatever you decide to do. Also consider that when individuals lose their jobs or their homes, What are they sometimes relegated to doing? Living out of their car. Now, obviously, this scenario isn't by choice, but that alone should really illuminate the fact that this lifestyle is extremely cheap. It's immensely freeing and rewarding. If you could make all the money you needed and more working half of the year and doing whatever you wanted for the rest of the year, what if your scenery and front porch view could change from the desert one day to the ocean the next? What if you weren't tied down to a fixed location for years on end working a job you hate to pay for a house that you basically, likely, only sleep in. Better yet, what if all of those things were well within your reach? Van nomadism is a terrific interim lifestyle. For me, the dream is still to find freedom on the open ocean, but I'm not going to wait around to be free. Therefore, van nomadism serves as a great interim lifestyle. In Vanu Book 2, Letters from Rayo, he writes, I have never maintained that motorized nomadism is a panacea. I did choose it for and have found it to be an excellent interim lifestyle for someone still extensively involved in the servile society. Even if your end goal is something different, why not begin to live free in the here and now? The modern van nomad community is incredible, and you don't have to do this alone. As I said, van nomadism is kind of trending right now. One YouTube search will garner months of content. But this van nomad community does not only exist in the digital realm, it also exists in the physical realm. 
This is one of the things I'm most looking forward to. Many of these folks are Vanuan. They just have never heard of the word. These are individuals who, for whatever reason, decided that a normal life in the servile society was not for them. Instead of political crusading and begging the masters to change the system, they pursued direct action and created the life they desired themselves. Even if we have differing economic opinions or whatever, these people are serious, and I can't wait to meet them. To give you an idea of how many van nomads are out there, let me tell you about RTR, the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous. Every January in Quartzsite, Arizona, van nomads from all across America meet up for a week in the desert to mingle, learn from each other, and get help in building out their vans. In 2018, some 4,000 nomads were in attendance. I'm hoping to attend in 2020. By that time, there will likely be well over 5,000 nomads in attendance. To conclude, I'll end with a quote from a nomad who wrote into Innovator in March of 1968. So far, I have been too busy to travel extensively or to seek out especially attractive campsites. But already I have lived many exquisite days and evenings at beaches, mountains, and forests. I'm still learning the way of a modern nomad, but already I am free.